All right, here we go. So we finished last week and I was like, okay, cool. We, we kind of started talking about Moses a little bit. Where am I going to go this week? And as I thought about it more and more, I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll just kind of continue on. It won't be like a, a series within Moses, but let's just keep looking at Moses and see what we can learn from him or kind of uh, this part that we're going to cover today is almost a what not to do. Okay, part of today. So today my title is Simple Moses excuses excuses don't raise your hand but has anybody ever made an excuse yeah of course we all do we all do it several times a day so um, it's one of those messages to where it's pretty much you know it's going to hit all of us and um, if you haven't been here we're, we're continuing on in this simple series the reason why we're saying simple, this, this series, I just want to keep it simple, and I want us to be simple followers of Jesus, because I'm saying simple is clear, not complicated, easy to understand, simplified, transferable principles. That's what I want to do. I want to look at stories that most of us know inside and out, and see if I can pull something out of these stories that it's like, huh, I've never seen it like that. Maybe I'll have something that I can take back into my week and kind of transfer into my life and, and make some application out of that. So now, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag today. I have a goal. And my goal is that I would like all of us, myself included, to put yourself into some of these positions today that we're going to talk about. And, and, and really... I want us to check our hearts, because here's what we often do. When we hear a message today, and again, we're kind of coming, not coming in on the negative side, but we're seeing the wrong things that Moses did, and we have this tendency to go, well, I don't, I mean, I don't do that, but this would be a great message for, and then insert somebody's name right there, right? And that's what we often do, but I, I, I want us to try not to do that, and hey, by all means, share this message with somebody or whatnot, but... I want us to try to really put ourselves in this position because this is one of those messages where it's, we would be very tempted to, to not, to say, ah, see, that, that really, I don't, I don't really do that. Well, we all do. We all make a lot of excuses. So I want to start off with asking a couple of questions to kind of get the, the, the pump a little bit primed and see where we're going here. So um, by raise of hands, how many of you like being a part of something? Like you like having purpose, right? That's pretty much should be every single person in this room. We all like to have purpose. We were created to have purpose. And when you talk to people who are depressed or who are struggling in life, if you ask them what is your purpose, they probably wouldn't be able to tell you. So when we know we, we have this purpose, we have this goal, we have something that God has laid out in front of us, and that's what we're working towards. And we may not be making great strides at it at the time, but when we know that there's a goal, that's purpose. We were created to have purpose. So, okay, so we all have that, that, that goal. We like having purpose in our lives. Here's the second question. And I want to give you a second to think about this because this is really big. And this will really take us in the direction that we want to go today. What kingdom purpose is God fulfilling in your life right now? Think about it. What kingdom purpose is God trying to fulfill? Is he, has he been speaking to you? What kingdom purpose are you trying to work towards? And, and I, I mean, your job is cool and, and, and all of those other things in your life, but specifically, what has God called you to do in this season of life that you can point to and say, God is using this to further his kingdom. Like I am doing things that, and I say this all the time, things that are going to matter in 10,000 years. What is that thing? Here's probably a bigger question. Do you have one? I know some of you in this room are like, I know exactly what it is. Okay. I, mine's easy. Okay. And I, I hate to use this word, but it's my job. Okay, and I love what I do. I happen to do this as a job or as a profession, but I happen to be a, a preacher and a, a pastor that I get to minister to people. That's making a kingdom difference. So, I, I mean, I, I, get, I get easy, right? 
but you guys are the ones that are out there living in real life, and you, you have like other things going on, and believe me, I have plenty of other things going on. So I get it. It's a little bit of a trap question. Hopefully by today, you will really start praying, hey God, if, if I don't, if I couldn't think of something, would you please tell me what that purpose is? What, what kingdom purpose you have for me? And, and I'll give you a little bit of hint. I'm going to throw you a little bone at the end of the message and give you an opportunity to take one, okay? I promise I will do that. Now, last week we left off with Moses. Moses was a shepherd. He was kind of sent out for like 40 years, okay? And God appears to him in a burning bush. We all know this story. And God starts speaking to him and saying, hey, Moses, I've chosen you. I want you to go back to Pharaoh. I know you were raised in Egypt. I want you to go tell him what? That was an absolute and utter failure. I want you to go back to Egypt and go to Pharaoh and tell him there you go. Okay. It's like, man, I'm going to have to back up a little bit on this story. All right. So he says, you know, go tell him, let my people go. Uh, you know, we are not going to be slaves. I have heard them crying out to me now. Let them go. We are not going to be there anymore. We are going to go to the promised land. So Moses is, is speaking presently in our story, speaking to this burning bush. Audibly, God is talking to him. And we saw last week where, where God's just like, I want you to go do this. And he's like, yeah, but. And God's like, no, 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 yeah, but this. And Moses is like, oh, but I've got this thing and this is. And he's, he started this pattern of making up all of these excuses. And as, as we finished last week, I was like, man, it just, he just keeps on going and keeps on going. And he's persistent that that will we'll give him that. Unfortunately, he's being negatively persistent. So if you've got your Bibles, Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to kick off right here in verse 16. So God is still in the burning bush, and he's speaking to him. So Exodus chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. That was one of his problems before. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Realize, God is in such control of this situation, and he just keeps building upon his promises to Moses that he's like, listen, not only are they eventually, it's going to take a while, it's going to take some plagues, some hardship for them, but they're not only just going to send you away, they're going to pay you to leave, okay? That's how much God is in control in this situation, God didn't have to work hard at this. God didn't have to be like, oh, I hope this works out. He was in absolute control and gave him another clue and assurance. And he said, hey, this is going to be so good. They're going to they're give you all kinds of gold, silver, and, and all kinds of great clothing to just say, go, get out of here. God is in control. Now, based on God's responses to Moses' lame excuses, should that have been enough? Like thinking it back to last week, should that have been enough for Moses to finally say, okay, God, I will obey? Should that have been enough? Yes. Do you think that's enough? Unfortunately, no. 
Here's where we come in. I'm really, really glad none of us are stubborn and hard-headed and have to take like 800 times of God going, dude, are you listening to me? And we're like, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, 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 sure. And we go off and do our own thing. I don't know about you guys. I am very, very guilty of that. Chapter four, verse one. Moses answered, should have been enough. What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Boom, here he comes back. More excuses. Now, what is Moses doing? What do we call this? It's a really bad word. It starts with W. Worry. He's worrying. He's thinking ahead. In fact, what are the first two words that he says? What if? Did we talk about what ifs recently? We have a couple times, haven't we? About those what ifs that we just conjure up in our minds. What if this happens and what if this happens? And we come up with all of these excuses. Um, A great theologian once said, if ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. You just write that down. You'll get it later. All right. So remember, God has already come to him in a burning bush, okay, that didn't, you know, wasn't consumed. That's kind of crazy. He heard God's audible voice. God knew his name and he used it twice. Moses, Moses. God specifically promised that he would later on worship on that mountain. He would come back here into the promised land on Sinai and worship there once he leads the people out. Uh, There was a promise that God's presence would go with him, which that was a big deal. And a promise that the Egyptians are going to pay them to leave. So again... Should that have been enough for Moses to say, okay, God, I get it. I will obey you. Should that have been enough? Yes. Do you think it was? No, right? But what did Moses do again? He made it about himself. Remember, we looked at that last week, and it was just like God would say something and say about about him, and Moses would say, yeah, but I. And every single time we do that, we lose. Every time we take the focus off of God and put it back on ourselves, no matter what, we lose. Here's our first point. Simple followers of Jesus fail the moment they make it about themselves. Every single time we take the attention off of God and put it on ourselves, it's an immediate failure. Now, Think about it. If God commands us something and we fail to obey, if we make it about ourselves and we don't follow what God wants us to do, what's at stake? Is anything at stake? Well, I wrote a a handful of things down. What's at stake if you fail to obey God? Well, there's disobedience, right? I mean, that's first and foremost. Like, nobody wants to disobey God, but if you fail to obey God, That's just disobedience right there. Um, How about incredible loss? What if Moses said no? What if Moses refused to go? Now, probably God would have chosen someone else and all of that, or I don't know exactly how that would have worked, but just what if Moses didn't go? The whole nation of Israel would have been left in slavery in Egypt. So there's disobedience, incredible loss. Um, If you fail to obey God, you'll lose out on blessing, won't you? I mean, God has all of this blessing like in store for us. But if we fail to obey him, he's not going to pour out that blessing on us. Um, What about fulfilling your purpose? That's one of the things that we're talking about today. If we don't obey God, we don't get to fulfill our purpose. And that brings purpose. I hate to keep using that word. That brings purpose into our lives. That fills us. That makes us complete. That, That does what God has put us together to do, to have purpose, to bring him glory, to worship him. Uh, We would miss out on furthering God's kingdom. Uh, As a follower of Jesus, I don't know about you. I can't speak for you. I know it's very, very important as followers of Jesus that we are to be furthering his kingdom. This is is not just a faith that we are to keep for ourselves. This is a, 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 I like to say it, a go and tell gospel, not a come and see gospel. Okay. Uh, also, we could lose out on personal growth opportunities because 
when you step out in faith and you obey God, guess what happens? Crazy, he comes through, okay? And you go, wow, that was really cool. God came through. And what does that do? It grows your faith. So then when the next situation comes along, you say, okay, God, you came through the last time. I'm going to step out in faith more, and it's probably going to be a bigger situation, and he's going to come through, and your faith grows. And that's how we grow our faith, by stepping out in faith and trusting and obeying God. Simple followers of Jesus fail the moment they make it about themselves. Verse 2, then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Now, you may not like snakes. Okay, I'm one of those weirdos that kind of does like snakes. So, you know, maybe you like, yeah, I would run from it too. But remember, this is a miracle that God is doing right there from his hands, if you've ever doubted God's patience, like, I mean, uh, I say this all the time. If, if I was God, it would probably have been right there that I'd be like, all right, dude, you're done. Like, I'm trying to show you a miracle, and you're running away from it. You don't even have the faith to stay and see what I am doing in this. Verse 4, then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And maybe some of you guys would have been like, nope, I'm done right there, God. Okay, so Moses reached out. And took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Now, that's pretty cool. Being able to just perform a miracle whenever you want, that would be pretty cool. Okay, that might be the time where I would go, okay, God, that's, uh, that's a pretty cool sign. I will go obey. And this would be about the time that Moses would jump in with another excuse, and I think probably God knew he was going to come in with another excuse, so he doesn't even give any time for Moses to speak. Look at verse 6. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak And when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. Now again, God is so wise that he doesn't even let Moses speak because... Well, we'll see in a few minutes. He would have just come up with another excuse, and it goes right into verse 9. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Now, God gives him the ability to perform three miracles right on the spot. How cool is that? Now, I was thinking about this. So I'll ruin the story, but he eventually does accept what God has given him to do. He goes back to his father-in-law, basically asks for permission to leave, and then he makes the journey to Egypt. Now, if it was me, and I I just, I want to know, like, this might be one of those questions I will ask Moses when I see him in heaven. Like, okay, like, when it was all done and, like, you were journeying back, how many times did you just, for fun, throw your staff down? right? Or just, or do this and go, uh, you know, and then, oh, it's, I mean, because I, I'm one of those guys where I would just do that over and over, like maybe just because it was cool. And then right before I got to Egypt, I'd be like, okay, I'm just going to make sure this still works, right? And throw the staff down. But I, I would have done that because that's, I don't know, that's just kind of my faith being stretched just a little bit here. Verse 10, you would think that was enough, Three miracles on the spot. Verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Now, do you imagine that God in this moment was like, Oh my goodness, I am so sorry, I forgot. 
I forgot you have a stutter or a speech impediment or you freeze up when you get in front of people. We don't really know what the problem was. But God probably didn't say, I'm so sorry, I forgot. You're right, you're right. I shouldn't have asked you. I'll go find someone else. You think that's what God did? Probably not. Here's our second point. Simple followers of Jesus lose when they look at their weakness rather than God's strength. Again, that's that thing where we take our focus off of God and we put it on us, and not necessarily just us, but the weaknesses inside of us, especially when God had already called him to go do something. He would have known God knew about his trouble with speaking, but God already chose him. So it's almost like these aren't necessarily excuses. He's trying to get out of it. But when we focus more on our deficiencies, we are not focusing on what God can do and what God wants to do in our lives. Now, I want to I let you in on a little secret. Now, okay, this is just between you and I. Now, I want to make sure you guys know we're best friends, right? Like you and I are best friends. Don't tell the person next to you because then they're, they're going to think that them and I are best friends, but they're not. You and I are best friends. So as a good best friend, I am going to let you in on a secret, okay? Are you ready? I can do this because I'm a best friend with you. You're pretty weak, all right? I can say that because we're friends, right? And I love you, and you know I love you. You are pretty weak. You cannot accomplish very much on your own. That's just the cold, hard facts, isn't it? Now, I want to tell you something else as your friend, all right, that is much, much better than that. And that is God is all-powerful and all-knowing. So here's what happens. Here's, here's us in our weakness. We, we, we can't accomplish much, okay? Lots and lots of weakness. And here is God in his strength, in his power, in his might, in his all-knowing, his omniscience, uh, like, like omnipotence, like he is everything that we need. Apart from him, nothing. Him, everything. Here's what happens. When we join with him, when we're like, hey, God, I, I, I'm on board with what you have. I'm going with you. I want your presence with me. I'm going to rely on you. You get to tap into that all-knowingness and all-powerfulness. And I'm, now I'm just making up words, okay? But we get to tap into that. And, and when, we, when we part from God, guess what? We lost that ability. But when we are with God like this, we get to tap into that. And that's what God is looking for from us, to, to be so close with him, to be able to tap into some of that power, to be able to trust him, not look at our own problems and weaknesses and our, our speech impediments or, or, or whatever, but hey, God, with you, I can do all things. There is nothing that you will call me to do that, that I can't do because you have empowered me to do that. And I, I just want to say this. If God has been nudging you to do something, you know that, and I, I almost hesitate to use this word, but it's, it, it feels kind of annoying sometimes, right, when God is nudging you so much. At least that's what we think of it at the time. And he's like, hey, I, I, I want you to do this. I want you to talk to that person at work. I want you to step out and join this ministry. I, I want you to, to do that thing, whatever that thing is. When, when, when God is doing that, and, and sometimes he speaks that like directly into your, 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 your spirit and, or your heart, or you're just, you know, I, I don't really know. I just feel like God is calling me to do this. Or maybe you read something in scripture that made you think, oh, God, okay, I know what you are trying to get me to do. Or maybe you've heard me preach something, and you're like, okay, I think God's leading me in a direction. If God's nudging you to do something, he will equip you to do it, to have the courage to do it, to have the faith to do it, to have the power and the strength to do it. Remember we said last week what trust is? Trust is believing God has your best interest in mind even when it doesn't look like it. That's what trust is. 
So don't look at your inabilities. Look at what God is able to do. Um, I was thinking this week, <clears throat> when Jesus gave the disciples the, the great commission, you know, the go into all the world, that whole thing, and he departed this earth, do you think that the, the disciples were ready? Do, do you think they were prepared to go into all the world? Let, let's, let's do a little recap here, okay? Jesus, just a few weeks before, uh, had been arrested and crucified and left to die on a cross. All of his disciples scattered that night when he's arrested, and we believe only one disciple stayed at the cross while he was being crucified. That was John. Okay, so great friends there. Um, Peter, pretty much his best friend, denied him three times, even though Jesus told him, hey, you're going to deny me. And he's like, I'm never going to deny you. And he's like, you're going to deny me three times. And then boom, shortly thereafter, Peter, his best friend, denies him three times. Um, Tommy, Tommy didn't do all right, right? Tommy doubted everything, right? Um, Judas, do we even have to talk about Judas, right? Not necessarily the group of guys that any of us would pick that were going to go change the world, huh? But they did. And in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, it says, Therefore, Jesus is speaking to them, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And they probably would have said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Okay, I don't know if you realize this. But, like, there's not even 12 of us here anymore. There's only 11, and, like, not that 12 would have done any good anyway. But, Jesus, how are we going to go out into all the world? And Jesus would have gone, just, guys, hold. I'm not even done yet. They're like, okay, sorry. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And they go, whoa, 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 Jesus, Jesus. Okay, not only do you want us to go into all the world and, and teach and preach and then baptize them and then like like don't don't you know Jesus don't you really know who we are and Jesus would have said I'm I'm still not finished yet I, I didn't get to the best part here's the best part right here and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age Jesus promised that his presence his spirit would go with them and what do you know? These 11 misfits, and they picked up another one along the way. They went and changed the world. And we are here, right here in this moment, because of them. They weren't ready. They weren't equipped. They surely had their problems and weaknesses. But they relied on God. Back to verse 10. <clears throat> Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, listen to this verse. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now pause for a second. This is a really, really big verse. And I want to scratch the surface on it. Maybe we'll come back another day and talk about it. But look at it. Did, did God just admit that he causes or allows suffering or difficulty or pain or different circumstances? Did he just admit that? Yes, he did. And... God purposely makes us flawed. Another way to say that is not perfect for a reason. Do you know why that reason is? So that we will not think we can do it on our own and that we will trust in him. That we will have a need for a savior because if you are perfect and if you have it all figured out, guess what? You don't need a savior. If you don't have any problems in your life, You've got it all on your own. And you wouldn't call upon your Savior. Here's another reason why he does that. And, and again, it's kind of like the law in the Old Testament. Why did God give them the law? I mean, like, you know, you've got the big ten commandments, right? 
Those are hard enough to keep. And then there were like 613 or so other laws and things. It was basically impossible. Why did God give them the law if he knew it wasn't possible for them to keep? So that they would rely on God and not themselves. It was to show them that they needed God. Same thing. But a whole another reason why he allows us to go through suffering and pain and all this, we talked about it last week, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I can't say that I like it. But again, what do you do when you don't know something about God? You go back to what you do know about God. And do you know what I do know about God? If I'm struggling with God, why did you allow this? And we all have those struggles. Don't act like you don't. We all do. God, how could you if I had a nickel? But you know what you do when you go back to those I don't know times? You look at what you do know. And I do know I have a God who loves me so much he sent a Savior to die for me. Like, and, and, and him dying for me so I could have eternal life is, is, that is such a bigger thing than my problem on this earth. And so if I know he loves me enough to send a savior, I think I can trust him enough with whatever that problem is that I have on this earth. So do I read verses like verse 11 and go, um, God is admitting that he allows this or causes this at times? And do I sometimes look at it and struggle with it? Yes, but you go back to what you do know and that God loves you enough to send his son to die for you. Verse 12. Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Now, that should have been enough right there. That, that, that you would think after all, all of everything, like every time Moses came up with another excuse and another excuse, God was just like, I got you. I've got this figured out. Here's the plan. Here's how we're going to move forward. Boom. Here's, here's three miracles you can do. All right. And you would think Moses would be done at that point. And he kind of was done at that point. But he was done making excuses, but not in a good way. This last verse right here says it all. Verse 13, but Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. Turns out all of those reasons why he couldn't do it, they were just excuses and they didn't matter anyway. He just didn't want to go. It was just an attempt for him to get out of what God was calling him to do. Because he just straight up just says, hey, God, listen, I, I don't want, just ask somebody else. I don't, I, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. I love this quote by Coach Ernie Hornung. It says, an excuse is the skin of a lie wrapped with a reason. Chew on that for a second. And we said, we all make excuses, right? An excuse is the skin of a lie wrapped with a reason. And I'll just put it this way. Anytime God commands us to do something or we feel that, you know, what we think is an annoying little nudge by God calling us to do something, and we come up with 101 reasons to not do it, hmm, they're really just excuses, which are really just lies why we will not obey God. Here's our third and final point. Simple followers of Jesus realize God cares more about your availability than your ability. Uh, again, I'll let you in on a little hint. God doesn't really need your ability. I think he can pretty much accomplish anything without your ability. Now, does God use our experiences and our training and our education and all of that? Does he use that normally to accomplish things? Yes. When we are following his will and when we're available to him, he's like, oh, I can use them because they are skilled in this field and they can accomplish this and they'll already, and, and yeah, that's great when God uses that, but God doesn't really need that. What God needs is our availability. God needs us to stop kind of strong-arming him 
That's what it's called in football, right? How do you, is that what it is? What is it? Stiff arm? Yeah, I don't watch football, okay? Sorry. All right, stiff arm. Thank you, Jake. Jake played football, okay? Shout out. When we are just, God, not, now's not a good time. God, I, I, I don't think I can do that. And we make up all of these excuses. They're just, God, I just don't want to obey you. And again, God cares about our availability. When we say, hey, God, listen, and, and, and this, this is my story, okay? This is me. God, I'm, I'm sorry. It was so weird. I thought, I, I, I thought you said you wanted me to be a senior pastor. That would be crazy, God. Like, like. Don't you know me? Don't you know my inabilities? And, 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 and he's like, yep, I sure do. Yep, that's what you're going to do. And I'm like, okay, God, that's wild, but let's go. Six years today, here I am. I, I wish I could say I've always made that choice to allow God to use me. But just that saying, yes, God, I will be obedient. I will, whatever that nudge is, God, I want you to use me however you can. Now, I I, I wrote this thing down, and it kind of, again, goes back to last week, and you'll see where we're going with this. I just want to read it. If you think God's calling or purpose on your life, your ability to make a kingdom difference or your potential to be effective is based on your talent or your ability and can only be successful if you make it happen, you are sadly mistaken. See that? If you think this has anything to do with you, you are sadly mistaken. It doesn't. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just up here because I love you speaking truth to you. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with being obedient to God. It's just like, like salvation. Like, like we think we can add things to salvation. We think we can or we need to add things to God's grace. Like I have to add my good works. Now, should we be good people striving for righteousness? Absolutely. But does God need us to be good people so that we could spend eternity with him? Nope, not in the Bible. And again, the moment you think you can add to God's grace and mercy that you can help him out in that way, I'm sorry. It's just not in scripture. Remember last week we said, our our third point was simple followers of Jesus know that God is everything you need. Everything you need. Not you, not your ability, although he will use those abilities and talents. He just needs your availability. Now, I made a promise at the beginning of service. Speaking of availability... We have something uh, here at ICC called starters. If you would put that slide up there. Nice, huh? <clears throat> okay. If you don't know what a starter is, again, I said it earlier, we don't call uh, volunteers volunteers. We call them starters. Because, and the reason why I wrote this, a starter is more than a volunteer. We believe the sermon starts in the parking lot or lobby as guests and visitors are unknowingly critiquing their entire church experience before the sermon ever begins, or even begins. Therefore, one of the most important parts of their Sunday visit is a warm greeting, a comfortable golf cart ride from the public's parking lot, a smooth children's drop-off experience, or even a friendly smile or handshake from a greeter. Starters are the hands and feet of Jesus through serving. Now, I want to make this really, really easy for you, not just because, hey, we're always looking for starters, but I would be remiss if I came up here and preached to you this big message about listening to what God is doing or speaking to you or serving or stepping in and being available to God. I would be remiss if I didn't offer you a very, very simple opportunity to do so. It just happens, by the way, have you heard? We had 54 kids in the back last week. 
Did you also hear we had to create a whole nother class this week for toddlers? So do we now have some more gaps in children's ministry? Absolutely, we do. Could we always use more people standing at the door, greeting people, shaking hands, taking people to seats? Absolutely. Could we always use more help in the sound booth with tech and things like that? Sure. There's all kinds of serving opportunities here at the church. And you know what? I I alluded to it earlier. When you serve, you know what you're doing, and, and it's really easy to say this about the kids' church workers, like I said earlier. You're not just serving kids back there. Like, like, okay, well, let's just talk about the nursery for a second. You could say Jesus all day long to them. They're not going to get it, okay? You're not getting any babies saved, okay? Can and do we pray over those babies when they're in there? Absolutely. So are, are you like, okay, I'm, I'm, I've got slobber all over me, and like I had a screaming baby the entire time. The, like, how is this furthering God's kingdom? It's allowing a parent to get like one hour of, oh my goodness, that like, thank you, here, take this thing, right? Right? And just to come in here and, and, and hear a message. So every single starter position around here helps us further God's kingdom at this church. I happen to like this church. I happen to like this church a lot. I happen to think this church is doing some awesome things and is growing like crazy. We're not even really in season yet. We don't have all of our snowbirds back yet, and we were about 240 people last week. That's awesome. We are growing, and what do we want to do? We want to serve people. We want to serve people in this church. We want to serve people in this community, and we want to serve people in this world. And you've got an opportunity to do that, to be a starter. So all of that said, if you're interested in being a starter, which hopefully you are after all of that, if not, that's okay. Right in front of you, there's a card. You can just put your info on that card and just say, I want to be a starter. I'd like to serve in this area, and we'll reach out to you and contact you. Or if you want to uh, get in children's ministry or guest services, you can talk to Nikki, but just make sure uh, she gets your information on a card. Uh, And that's just a great opportunity, and, and guys, it's really simple. Okay, I'm not asking anybody to prepare a sermon and go stand on a corner and on a soapbox and go preach a message. Now, if you want to do that, let's talk about it, okay? But I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just asking you to start with just serving. And some of you guys are um, amazing. You already serve in like 42 different areas in this church. I'm not talking to you guys, okay? I just want to make sure you know that. So, Let's wrap this up. Here's our three points. Number one, simple followers of Jesus fail the moment they make it about themselves. Number two, simple followers of Jesus lose when they look at their weakness rather than God's strength. And number three, simple followers of Jesus realize God cares more about your availability than your ability. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you count us worthy to serve in your kingdom, to serve in your church. God, this this might be Island Community Church, and we may have a senior pastor and a board of elders and, and, and a staff and all of that, but God, this is your church. So God, thank you that we get to serve in your church, that you have called us and that you entrust us enough with all of our junk in our lives and our inabilities and all of that, God, you still trust us with your great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. God, help us to do that in our words. God, help us to do that in our actions. God, help us to do that in our reactions as a, as a broken, dying world watches us live. God, help them to see that we live differently, that there is just something different about us, that, that, that we, even though we are going through difficulty and, 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 and pain, that we can still keep a smile on our face and keep joy in our hearts, knowing that, God, even if we don't understand what's going on, we can trust you enough because we know that you died on a cross for me. That is so awesome, Lord, to know that we have that assurance of salvation through your son, Jesus. That, God, your word says we don't have to wonder 
if we're going to make it into heaven. That is nowhere in Scripture. That your word says that we can know that we have eternal life with Jesus. Right now in this moment, heads bowed and eyes closed. If that's you, if, if you don't have assurance right now, if you step from this life into the next, you don't have assurance that you would spend eternity in heaven. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. If that's you and you want to make that choice today, just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want you in my life. I'm tired of doing this on my own. I I, I invite you into my life. I accept that you died on a cross for me. And better yet, rose three days later. God, change my life. God, I give you my life. Again, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to know that today is the day that you gave your life to Jesus. Would you just slip your hand up? I'm not going to call you out or anything. Just say, today's the day that I got it. God, I just pray for those of us who are looking for areas to serve you. God, would you speak so clearly to our hearts? Give us that purpose, God, that only you can give. God, I know there are broken people who are searching. God, may they find purpose in you. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, we lift it up to you as a sacrifice. God, help us to be generous as you have been so generous with us. God, help Island Community Church to be such a generous church that we can reach into this community and into this world and make a difference that's going to matter in 10,000 years. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. And it is in your awesome, most holy name that we pray. Amen.